All right, hi everybody, John Meadows here, and today I'm with my friend, Dr. Allo, and we're gonna talk about my health and where I'm at. I know it's been a while um, since I've talked about it, and I think you all know I had an echo done, an echocardiogram done a little while back. But first, before we get into any of that, tell everybody who you are. So my name is uh, Mohamed Allo. I'm a cardiologist out of Toledo, Ohio. I grew up in Toledo. Uh, I did all my medical school and medical training in Chicago, and then I moved back to Toledo because my family lives there. Um, I'm also a certified personal trainer and an amateur bodybuilder, not like this guy, um, but it's fun. I've been doing it for like the last two or three years. I played football. I coach football. It's a lot of fun. So I've always been involved with sports. I've played almost every sport and coached uh, my kids in almost every sport as well. So I'm very involved with athletics, and I, and I like it a lot. Um, we're here to talk about John's health today. Yeah, so um, as Dr. Allo mentioned, he is a cardiologist, so um, he has a specialty in this area. I was very interested in getting his opinion, and we had actually met a couple years ago in Toledo, but I wanted to get his opinion, and <clears throat> you'll see why in a few minutes. So what we're going to start with today is <clears throat> I wanted to start with just an update on my blood work. Um, I get a lot of questions on well, what's your blood, blood work like, you know, how are things looking? So we're going to put some pictures up as Dr. Allo and I talk. And so you're going to see the same numbers that we're looking at. So we're going to just kind of real quickly go through my blood work so you can get some kind of idea of what my blood work actually looks like. So I'm actually going to show you. And Dr. Ella has permission to talk about it, so we're not violating any HIPAA rules <laughs> or All something, right. something like that. So the first thing on the blood work that we have and what everybody wants to know about is what's your testosterone levels. And uh, my testosterone level is currently 852 nanograms per deciliter. The range on that's 250 to 1100. Now that's with me taking 100 milligrams of testosterone a week. I do want to share with you that um, when I initially had my heart attack, I was taking a replacement dose of 200 milligrams, and the cardiologist uh, seemed, seemed a little concerned, like maybe that's too much, it's a replacement dose. But um, So I told him it would be probably a little, probably not good to just stop it, but I did. I said, hey listen, you're smarter than I am, I'll take your advice. And so I stopped it, and after four weeks I had my testosterone tested it was 53, which is kind of non-existent. That's really it's bad. Very low, right? And I felt terrible. So <clears throat> the, um, Dr. Serrano, you guys know my friend Dr. Serrano, he said, get back when you're 200. And I just said, well, let me try 100. And so these, these numbers are on 100, which is actually, would you say that's pretty high for just 100 milligrams? No, I, I think it's like middle of the road. The, the problem with testosterone is you can't just stop it. Um, once you're on replacement therapy or, or you know hormone replacement therapy, it's something you got to continue because your body no longer will make it. So if you stop testosterone, I'm sure you know this already. <laughs> when you stop testosterone, um, you you're suppressed. You're not going to have any. I mean, his numbers went from somewhere in the range of 850 down to just 50, which is subtherapeutic and not physiological at all. Um, now you could wait like more than a year, and I know you've tried that before. Mm -hmm. You could wait a year or so and see if it comes back, but if you've been on it long enough, the likelihood of that happening is not very high. Um, it still can. There are some people who like will stay off of it for two or three years, and then it, it'll come back a little bit, but it's not going to get to 800. It might be like 200, 300, maybe four at the most. Um, but we know that people with really low testosterone um, have much higher cardiovascular risk, heart attacks, strokes, those kind of things go up with really low uh, testosterone. So you do want to be on testosterone replacement therapy if your numbers are super low. Now some of these people that take whopping doses of testosterone and their numbers are way super therapeutic, like you know some people taking like 1.5 grams a week or you know mm -hmm. even even 400, just depends on how your body responds, but people with mm -hmm. really high uh, testosterone levels uh, because of the way testosterone breaks down into DHT and estradiol and, and sometimes even increases your estrogen, you become some, what we call hypercoagulable. Your body clots faster than it should, and that's when you start seeing like blood clots in your legs or in your heart or you have strokes or heart attacks and those kind of things. So it's a range. We, you don't want your testosterone being way too low and you don't want it being super high. Your numbers look fine. You know, a, a male in his 40s, if he was on nothing even, somewhere in the range of 600 to about 1,000 is, is pretty normal. 
Um, and it all kind of depends on you feel, how you feel. We don't just put people on testosterone replacement therapy if you feel absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. You're not complaining of your libido. You feel great. You don't have a lack of energy. You're not fatigued. You can do everything you want to do. We don't replace people uh, you know, unless they're super low. But even then, if somebody comes in with a uh, testosterone of 100, but they feel fine, they're not asking for replacement or anything. There's really no reason to do that. Now, if they come in saying, I have no libido, I'm fatigued, I'm tired, I can't tired. do anything, I don't have any energy, I feel terrible, that's a different story, then they should be on something. Um, but definitely having your, your numbers in range is, is, is healthier for you, and, and that's been proven you know, time and time again with multiple studies. That was um, one of the things Dr. Serrano always says too, is he doesn't just treat numbers, he treats how people feel. Right, you have, you yeah. have to, especially yeah. with testosterone. Yeah, so, um, so pretty good shape there, um, but I did, I did, like I said, I did quit taking it, and I, and I felt terrible. I felt awful. Well, sure, So you've been on it for a uh, while. Yeah. Um, so the next thing on here is the lipid panel, which is another, this is probably the thing, the second highest questions I get regarding blood work, and it's total cholesterol, HDL, triglycerides, LDL. Total cholesterol is 105, HDL is 34, triglycerides are 89, and LDL is 54. Any thoughts on that? So those numbers are good. This is normal without any cholesterol medicine? Um, <clears throat> this is on something. After I had my heart attack, he put me on uh, Torvastatin. Okay. So, so I, those numbers are perfect. Normally, uh, we want your cholesterol under 200, but if you're going to be on a Torvastatin anyways and you already had a heart attack or stroke, we'd rather it be around 100, 120. There's no reason to take a medicine and, and you're at 198. Yeah. You know, what's the point of being on a medication and popping a pill every day if your cholesterol is still almost 200. Mm -hmm. um, so 105 on the total cholesterol is perfect. Um, your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, we want men above 40, mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right at 34. There's only really two ways to make your good cholesterol go up. One of them is exercise, which you do, um, and another one is a, is a B vitamin called niacin. Um, not much else really has been proven over time. Sometimes they, you know, they've gone back and forth on dark chocolate or red wine, saying that can sort of raise your, your good cholesterol, but it's been proven not to. Okay. Uh, but definitely exercise and niacin do. The thing with niacin is you have to be on it for a long time before it actually raises your HDL. It's not like an overnight thing. Cholesterol medicine, you take it, the next morning your cholesterol is low. Mm -hmm. HDL takes time. You've got to be on it for at least a year, year and a half before we have a noticeable difference in your HDL. Gotcha. Um, the problem with niacin is it causes you to flush and it doesn't feel good. So we, we tell people like take it and go to sleep right away or, or pop an aspirin an hour before because that kind of helps with it. And then go to sleep an hour later and, and hopefully you won't feel it or notice it. But that's how we know that the niacin that you're taking, unless it's prescription, but let's say you're taking a supplement that says it has niacin in it, that's how we know it actually contains niacin because yeah. it causes you to flush. Mm -hmm. um, your triglycerides is more of a... A measure of how well your blood sugars are controlled, and yours are fine. 89 is, is, is perfect. Anything under about 160 is considered. I've never really normal. had any issues with that, and I could adjust my diet and lower my right. sugar, and it would always come down if I really wanted to. Yeah, but the one thing we one. we see a lot is somebody who's diabetic will come in, and their blood and their triglycerides are through the roof, and everyone wants to treat just their triglycerides and not get their blood sugars lower. So what I like to focus on, and I and I think other cardiologists would agree get their blood sugars under control, you'll see their triglycerides go down really nicely, and it's better for them. You know, if their sugars are down, they'll, they'll feel better. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, less bad uh, outcomes. Um, the biggest problem is LDL, not in you, yours is really good, but LDL is bad cholesterol, and that's what has been associated without question now with heart attacks, strokes, peripheral artery disease, any cardiovascular disease. The higher your LDL, the more likely you are to suffer from a heart attack or stroke. We have something called the 60, 60, 60 guarantee. If your LDL is below 60 and your triglycerides are below 60, which yours aren't yet, and your good cholesterol is above 60, which, which yours isn't, oh. we can almost guarantee that you'll never have a stroke or heart attack again. You're close. So I got a little work to do then, okay. But, but a lot okay. of it is genetic and there's not yeah. a whole lot you can do. But an LDL below seven, if somebody's had a heart attack or stroke, we usually want to be very aggressive and get your LDL under 70 and you are well below 70. And we know the lower your LDL, the less likely you are to have a future heart attack or stroke or a first heart attack or stroke. So your numbers look really, really good. Okay, good. Um, so uh, going down to, this is one that I've always had people, I've encouraged people, HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, measure of inflammation in your body. I've always felt like that was pretty important. It's 0.4. 
So yeah, so that's really low. It's a, it's a measure of overall inflammation. So the, mm. the problem with it is it can fluctuate so much. People who are obese have much higher inflammation. You're not obese, you're, you're pretty lean. Um, the leaner you are, the less likely you are to have inflammation. Now there are some people who have genetic conditions that have really high inflammation like lupus and rheumatic disease like rheumatoid arthritis and some other inflammatory you know, bowel diseases and whatnot. Their CRPs are really high. Yours is quite low, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, the problem with CRP is almost anything can raise it. Um, no if somebody punches you in the stomach, yeah. it's gonna go up a little. Or yeah, you get the flu or pneumonia or something bad happens, I had, it's even stress. Funny that you say that because one time, m mine's always been good, but one time it was nine. Yeah. Like it just out of the blue went up to nine. Must so, have been something going on. And then it was normal again, so. Yeah, so uh, that one I don't generally check on people okay. commonly, unless there's like a really good reason to. Okay. Good to know. Same with homocysteine. I see you've got that on there yeah, too. It's I, also um, an inflammatory marker. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say the same thing about that as we said about CRP. It's a general inflammatory marker. It can go up and down. Now, some people have really high homocysteine that's genetic. It's a genetic condition. You don't have that. It's pretty low. Yours is your number seven, and anything below like 10 or 12 is really, really normal. Um, another one, and I think this is big for... You know, there's a lot of bodybuilders who watch this channel, and one of the things that we see a lot of is kidney issues. Sure. So, and obviously we want to keep an eye on our BUN, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, EGFR, all those. So my blood urea nitrogen is a 17, creatinine is 1.27, and EGFR is 66. Those are typically where my numbers are year-round. That's that, pretty And close. that's pretty normal. Creatinine is a measure of muscle breakdown. The more muscle you have, the higher your creatinine is. So even in a, in a male like you, even if it was 1.4 uh, or even higher, because you're so muscular, we can't use the general population's normal mm -hmm. uh, to tell you how your kidneys are doing. It's a measure of muscular breakdown waste product. Same with BUN. Mm -hmm. It's a measure of nitrogenous waste product breakdown, which is muscle breakdown. So maybe I'm not training hard enough. <laughs> Maybe I gotta train harder to get these numbers. Yeah, back well, up. maybe you need more. You need more muscle mass. It's not enough. Um, no, but your numbers are fine there. And then um, my AST and ALT. So those are uh, liver enzymes that can sometimes get elevated. My AST is twenty nine. My ALT, ALT is thirty nine. Honestly, these are in range. I've I've never those really those are had really these. really low. We don't usually worry yeah. about those till they're in the two to three hundred range. People have hepatitis or a viral hepatitis or took too much Tylenol or just damaged their liver, they'd be in the thousands. Um, so okay. your numbers are really, really good. Usually they check that after you've been put on a statin medication. Like if you've had Almost, a heart attack yeah. and they put you on like a torvastatin, um, which you told me you're on. Mm -hmm. um, then we check that to make sure that the atorvastatin is not affecting your liver. If your numbers start to creep up, we accept it going up to about 250, 300, and that's acceptable because the, 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 the benefit of a torvastatin lowering future heart attacks and strokes and death rates is much more um, than the slight maybe liver damage you're getting from a slightly elevated AST gotcha. or ALT. But your gotcha. numbers are phenomenal. Those have always been it. really good. And even like when I was competing at the highest level and pushing my body the hardest, the only thing that ever even budged those was um, acetaminophen. That, that will. That's Tylenol, the only thing that ever budged those numbers. Medications, uh, lack of blood flow to your liver, and a viral hepatitis are the only things that can really get that into the thousands. But yeah, a little bit of Tylenol will make it go up a little. You might get into the You went four, up to like 100. Yeah, four, yeah, you can even get yeah. up to four or 500, but then as soon okay. as you stop it, it'll go away. It, and it did in my case. Yeah, so 100 is not bad at all. I was I was like almost in a panic. Um, but then as soon as I stopped it, it called me. right away. <laughs> this was, it was actually when I was dieting for the Arnold Classic. Um, hemoglobin A1C is another kind of real big one that I, I like to keep an eye on. Uh, and my, my number is five, under 5.7 is what you generally look for. Yeah, so that's a measure of your average blood sugar over the last two to three weeks. So 5.0 is really, really low. Under 5.7 is considered normal. 5.7 to about 6.4 is pre-diabetic. 6.5 and higher is diabetic. You're way, way low, so there's no worry there. Next page. Um, let me see. So bodybuilders, what are bodybuilders? They're concerned about, here's one, here's three things they're concerned about. Red blood cell count, RBCs, hemoglobin, hematocrit, which tend to be elevated in bodybuilders, right? I right. mean, that's what things do. It treats anemia and right. things like that. So all three of these are in range. They appear to be kind of the top end of the range. They are because you're probably slightly dehydrated. 
because you were fasting when you got these blood tests and, mm -hmm. and your body dehydrates a little. I always tell my patients when you go in to do these uh, fasting tests, drink tons of water, because first of all, it's easier for them to find your veins. Yeah. I uh, said so like poking you a hundred times. Plus your kidneys look better because they're well hydrated. Your creatinine won't be as high and your other stuff won't look as bad. Plus you're, you won't look so hemoconcentrated when your hemoglobin is 16.6 .6, like it is there. Mm -hmm. You're slightly elevated compared to, to, to normal. It's like at the high end of normal. Over mm -hmm. 17 is what we consider really hemoconcentrated. But that's because you've like, imagine you ran a marathon and you sweat out all your uh, plasma, but right. you still have the red blood cells, so right. it looks more concentrated, but it's fine. It was just probably because you were fasting. It's not anything to worry about. One of the things that was interesting is when I had my blood work done after my heart attack, my ferritin was really high and my DHE, DHEA was really low, like really low. Right. And um, I, I showed that to Dr. Serrano when he was talking about the stress pathways. And, right. Um, Does, he, go on. No, that was it. He, was, he showed me, he diagrammed the stress pathways and how it can change those. and. Now they're back to normal, but they were really messed up after my heart attack. So, Those two specifically. So there are there are inflammatory markers that go up when you're under a lot of stress. They're called acute phase reactants. Your TSH, your T4, your T3, ferritin. Um, those things will go up when you're really sick or under a lot of stress or nearly died. Um, those things generally go up, and then eventually they they normalize a few weeks later, and yours look like they're back to normal. So I wouldn't worry about those. I did on the DHEA, I did start taking 100 milligrams daily of that, and now put it in a normal range. Yeah, that, um, that should be fine. But um, and then the last thing on here is, I, I wanted to talk about fasted insulin. I didn't see it, but I know I have it on here. Oh, here it is, 10. So fasting insulin is one thing I try to have, keep an eye on with people too. Um, you know, I think sometimes people's fasting blood glucose can look normal, but it could just mean their pancreas is cranking out insulin to keep it normal. Right. So, like when, especially in pre-diabetics, yeah. What happens is you're if you're pre if you're insulin resistant, there's two types of diabetes. Type two diabetes, you're insulin resistant, while your blood sugar may be normal, it's because your pancreas is pumping out enough insulin. Like imagine you're, you're, there's a door and there's a really strong guy like John Meadows standing behind the door, not letting you in. And you keep throwing tons and tons of guys behind the other side of the door until they finally overwhelm them and push them over. Insulin resistance is like that. Your, your cells and your body is resistant to insulin, so your pancreas keeps cranking out more and more and more to force your blood sugars down and into the cells so that your body can utilize it. Um, but your numbers there are very normal. You know, it's, it's 10, usually up to about 20 is considered normal. Even though I eat an occasional pancake. Right. I have had pe people criticize. If you're in a calorie you deficit and you're lean, it's very, <laughs> very difficult for that to be a problem. Yeah. Um, so overall, any thoughts just on the blood work? So overall, I think your blood work looks great. I mean, if, if most of my patients had blood work like that, I probably wouldn't have a job. <laughs> so I, I would think just keep doing what you're doing. Stay on the, the cholesterol medicine and everything else looks real good. Stay active. Keep eating healthy. I think you'll do really well. Now, I went and got another test. I tend to, I love to take different tests. I just, uh, this was a new one for me. Um, so I had uh, my carotid artery scanned mm -hmm. for carotid artery disease and it came back as normal. And I don't know if you, if you have to deal with that much, but that's just something. Yeah, we do that a you. lot. So, so they measure the velocity across your uh, carotid arteries. Um, imagine a garden hose when you when you put your thumb over it and you're blocking half of it the velocity of the water shooting out because it's the same volume of water the same volume of water coming out of the, on this side has to equal this side mm -hmm. the only way it can get across and be the same volume of water is if, is if it goes faster across that area so they measure the velocity to see if there's a blockage downstream or upstream gotcha. um, and your numbers are very normal they're super low I mean they're so normal that they, they couldn't even really say anything and this is so for those of you who didn't catch that what Dr. Allen was talking about is the speed of your blood flow. Um, and this is measured in centimeters per second. So the speed is- So apparent. yours is, so under 125 we consider normal and yours is in the range of under 125, so. And then they tested me for atrial fibrillation, which we'll get into here later. It said normal, which I assume is just right. measuring at that point in they, time. Exactly, you could have AFib, it's just they didn't catch it when they did it. Yeah. So. AFib is just an irregular heart rhythm. It's the most common irregular heart rhythm. About 6 million Americans have it. It's not life-threatening, but it can cause stroke. So that's the reason why they check for that. Um, and they, I've never had this tested, abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's a new one for me. I've never had that one tested. Apparently so wrong. so these are when you rupture uh, your aorta and die. It's like an instant, very fast, quick death. 
people who smoke, the, the re, the, we, we screen for that, anybody who smoked over 55 cigarettes lifetime, like if you've ever smoked just 55 total cigarettes in your life, your chance of having an abdominal aortic aneurysm is higher. Your aorta that travels down your, your body and feeds blood into all your organs, it gets a little swollen and, and, and out of shape. It, it, it swells up and it's likely to rupture. So they screen that with an ultrasound to see how big it is. Usually, unless it's over like six centimeters or seven and a half in certain areas, it's not a problem. Yours was under three, so it's it's not a problem at all. And then um, they, they did a... Uh an osteoporosis, which was scan, which was fine. So that's incredibly rare yeah. in men. Yeah, um, then, and then I did fail the BMI. I did fail the body mass So all index. bodybuilders will yeah. fail the BMI because it's just how much do you weigh for your height is the question. That's and they asking. only have me at 205. I'm actually heavier than that. So my 32 was actually under Yeah, so 32, any of them 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and then 30, 30, and 30 to 40 is obese, so you're technically obese. Technically, I am obese. But... And bodybuilders, because you have so much muscle, you're going to be overweight or, or even obese in your case. Um, now, I have had a calcium score test done too, right. which, was a couple, that. which was a couple years ago. That tests calcification uh, in the arteries in your heart. Um, and it was a, my score was a, they, it was a 0, 0, and 18. They tested right. three vessels, which I was told was fine. Yeah, anything under 100 is considered normal, and, and the fact that it was zero, is, and most, the, most of the ones they measured were zero, is, is incredibly low. Basically, it's like a way of checking how much blockages you have in your arteries without actually opening you up or doing a cath or doing an invasive test. It's a mm -hmm. way of like screening. It's almost like an x-ray. It's a CAT scan that measures the calcium in your arteries to, to see if there's a lot of it or not because it's a predictor mm -hmm. of future ruptures or heart attacks and, and strokes. So yours was incredibly low. And then the other thing that I've had done twice now was a transesophageal electrocardiogram. I would actually stick a camera down your throat, down into your heart and look at it. And both times I was told my heart's normal size and um, they didn't see any real noticeable plaque um, build up. Excellent. Um, and that's... Yeah, so the reason um, they do it that way is because when they're doing the echogram through your your chest, there's muscle, and in your case a lot more than usual, but there's muscle and bone that you have to go through and you can't get a very clear, high-definition picture of your heart. So when you when you swallow the probe and it goes down your esophagus, your esophagus is right up against your heart. There's no muscle between there. There's no bone tissue. There's no calcium. You can see the heart in a very high definition, and it's crystal clear. That's why we do that sometimes, because you, if you need to define something you know specific, you do it that way so you can see a very clear picture of your heart. So that one, actually, that one sounds like one of the more important ones I've had done then, right? Gives you a really good picture. Definitely gives you a very clear picture of how strong your heart is, how well the valves are working, how, how the pumping function is, how well it relaxes, um, the blood flow across all the valves. That gives you crystal clear pictures. Okay. Um, I asked Dr. Allo to come here um, because I wanted another opinion. Sure. Now, I had an echocardiogram done. I don't know. It was, uh, it was recently. It was a couple weeks ago. It was on the 12th. So it was on August 12th. And I was expecting to go in there and I was expecting him to say, everything is great, I'll see you in six months. Because I felt so great lately. I have felt awesome, I've been training hard. Everybody knows I'm training hard, I, I feel good. And unfortunately, that is not uh, what he told me. So I'm gonna give you guys what sounds real scary. Now imagine if you're me, imagine how scary this would sound. So I had my echocardiogram done and we sit down and he asked me, you know, how you feeling? I said, great. And he's like, well, have you been getting tired? Have you been getting short of breath? And I said, no. And he, and I, you know, I thought, man, he's really trying to find something out here. And he said, well, your ejection fraction uh, looks to be 30 to 35%, which is low. And when you get into that range, we generally suggest you get an atrial um, defibrillator put in, which scares the crap out of me. That's like implanting a device in my chest. Mm -hmm. And he said, so there's a couple things we found on your echocardiogram. Your, your ejection fraction is low, it's 30 to 35%. And we have discovered in the apex of your left ventricle, so if you picture the heart, it's kind of at the bottom, of the left ventricle, he said that tissue has essentially died and you have a blood clot there. 
Um, now, that's very scary because a blood clot can break loose and it can, you know, go to my kidneys and go to my lungs and go to my head and go anywhere and can, and can kill me. Right. Very serious. And the ejection fraction being that low, we you mentioned atrial fibrillation, can result in atrial fibrillation, which also can be fatal uh, or really bad. So, you know, I'm hearing this and I'm like, wow, man, this, what, what I'm hearing is you can die at any second now. That's what I'm hearing. Well, we all could. You know, so it scares me. And I didn't do any videos on this. We were going to do a video and I didn't do any videos because mentally I was in shock. Sure. And I, I mean, for a week, I had a hard time even having a conversation with people because I was, I was in shock. And um, I talked to Dr. Serrano a little bit about it and I'll, I'll tell you what he said. And um, I've got another friend in Australia who actually watches these videos. He's a cardiologist. He's been real good to me. His name's Peter and he gave me his, some thoughts too. And um, it's important to me to understand some other opinions because it just seems weird that I feel so good. Now, so let me just read, read this to you. Mild left ventricular enlargement. Um, the left ventricular ejection fraction is 30 to 35 percent per visual estimation. And uh, so the entire apex is akinetic. So I read that and I'm like, oh crap. And I mean, that's kind of the scary stuff. And then you see normal right ventricular size and function, normal atria size. Um, uh, everything else seemed to be normal, but that bottom part of my heart, that apex seems to be dead or not moving and the, and the ejection fraction is what is what he said per visual estimation. So, um, thoughts on that? Yeah. So generally speaking, after somebody has a heart attack, their ejection fraction can go down. Not always depends on how fast it resolves or how quickly they get it out. Um, 30 to 35% is low. Normal is considered above 50. Um, and even above 40 is not bad. But 50 to 55 or even 60 to 65 is, is what most of the time we consider normal. So what they mean by akinetic is it means that the heart's not pumping. Those walls, you know, instead of pumping with each pump, they're just not moving that bottom part, like you said, that really mm -hmm. lower bottom part. The rest of it is squeezing, but that bottom part is just kind of sitting there. Um, there is a chance that this will get better. Um, and, and, and then the longer you go out from when they cleared out the, the heart attack and cleared out your arteries, the more likely it is to come back. Um, it takes time though, and, and you gotta exercise, and you do an exercise program called cardiac rehab to help it get better. We put you on all the right medications, which you're already on. Um, so yeah, it is, it is definitely something scary. Um, yeah, generally speaking, 34.9% or lower, you do qualify for a defibrillator. Um, and the reason for that is if you've had a if you've had a blocked artery plus a low ejection fraction, the chance of you going into what we call a deadly arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death is higher. Um, defibrillators do reduce that because it's like having a paramedic sitting inside your heart. Mm -hmm. If you were to go into a deadly rhythm, they, they would shock you and bring you out of it. Now, they don't always shock you right away. We can program them so that we can try pacing you out of it first. It'll pace you really fast and then let go and see if it, if it goes away. It'll try that a number of times. If that doesn't work, then we tell it to just give you a shock. It's not a shock like when they, you know, a huge one because mm -hmm. it's inside your heart. It doesn't need to be like a massive shock. You will feel it though. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely with an EF that low, uh, you do qualify for it. 30 to 35 is pretty low. Now, the problem with visual estimation is I could show this to 50 other cardiologists and they might not agree. Some might say it's 40, half would say it's, you know, more like 30. Um, they've found in studies that they, they, they've showed echograms to tons of cardiologists and they've done studies on this. Above 40%, they pretty much all get it right. 90% of cardiologists, if your EF is close to normal or just below normal, they all get it right. Really low ones, like 25% or lower, they all get it right too. It's those ones that are kind of in the middle, that like 25 to 40, 35 range where there's a huge variance. If we showed your actual pictures of your echo, to 100 cardiologists, half of them would probably say it's higher and half of them would probably say it's about that or lower. Um, so there's a huge variance there. Um, there are other tests you can do to confirm that. One of them is called a MUGA scan, which is sort of like a nuclear stress test. You, they inject a, a dye into your uh, veins and your heart takes it up and it lights up your heart muscle and then this camera picks up the, the radiation and it sees how strong your heart actually is pumping. The reason mm -hmm. we use that is because it's very reproducible. If I scanned you 100 times in a row, it would give me the same exact 
uh, numbers. The problem with this, if we did this 100 times in a row and showed it to 100 people, it, they would never, almost never have the same exact answer. Um, so the key to this is stay on the medications, which I'm sure you're doing. Um, keep exercising. You technically do qualify for a defibrillator with, because it says 30 to 35. If it said 35 only, you wouldn't, because 35 and up, you don't get a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. 34.9 and lower, you do. Um, but it's up to you. It, they have to recommend that. Um, having a blood clot sitting in the bottom of that chamber where the walls aren't moving very much, you got to be on blood thinners, and I know they put you on one. Um, and that'll dissolve over time, but once that part of the heart kind of comes back, if, if it does... Um, so then, do you think that part can actually come back? It can. It just depends. I didn't even know it was even possible for that to come back. It can. It, it, okay. It, and, it, and it takes time sometimes. Like we, I've had patients where their EF is 30 or even 25, and we put a defibrillator in, they're all set, they're on blood thinners, whatever. A year later, we check in, it's back up to 55. So it just kind of depends. You being young and healthy and, and conscious of all this makes it even better because you're always exercising and exerting yourself. Exercise actually does make your heart stronger. You just got to keep at it. Also, because the, the blood clot was there and that part of the heart was not, the muscle was not getting nutrients, wasn't getting oxygen, wasn't getting nutrients, wasn't getting blood flow. It got weaker and it got stunned or paralyzed and part of it may have died. Um, but now that it's got blood flow and oxygen and nutrition going down there, it, it can come back. We don't know, though. Okay. Um, if I had to guess, I would say yours will probably come back. It might not come back all the way to 55, but it could get pretty close. Mm -hmm. But it may come back to all the way to 55 and be normal again. So it kind of depends. Um, you just got to do your part and, and follow directions, do what they, what they ask you to do. And I think you, you, that's all you can do. We'll have to remeasure it. I would wait another three months and, and check again. Um, a defibrillator definitely would save you, though, if you were to go into a deadly heart rhythm. So that part is um, something to consider. Yeah, well, I don't, uh, I don't really want to. I don't really want to get a defibrillator. Well, they can't do it to you because yeah. that's assault. I mean, yeah. you have to decide and agree <laughs> yeah. to it. No um, one's going to like sedate you and force you to do. Well, it. I mean, I think the part that um, you have to be informed, and, and you yeah, are. It sounds yeah. like you've done. And, and I think he's just. And I think he's just. Um, Recommending based on what he's seeing for right. visual inspection. What the things that um, are odd to me is that everything I've read and studied says that you should feel a certain way at this percent. True. And that's the part that I don't feel the way that everybody says. Right. I should and when feel. I talked to you on the phone a few weeks ago, uh, the, based on how you were describing how you felt, I would guess that it's much higher. But but it's hard to tell. Like, it's in that range where it could go either way. If you showed mm -hmm. it to a bunch of people. I would most would say a little higher, most would probably say around that, and then some would say maybe even a little lower. But based on how you feel, yeah, somebody with an ejection fraction of like 30 to 35 would be a little more fatigued, short of breath, tired. They'd get swelling and puffiness in their legs, which I remember you told me you don't have any, and you're very active and you don't feel tired. You're not easily fatigued. You are. You have endurance. You have all that stuff. So my guess is it's probably higher than that. You could definitely get a MUGA scan. Normally, what I would do in this case, if a patient is really resistant. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but you don't want a defibrillator or resistant to getting a defibrillator, which I can understand. You don't want plastic and metal and things inside you that could suddenly shock you for no reason one day. Mm -hmm. um, I would get a MUGA scan and, and see what that shows. If it's 35.1, you don't need a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. Or if it's 35.0, you don't need a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. Anything above that, you would be fine. That would be my next step. And I'm sure your doctor could well, do that. Well, so, yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of getting... I, I have an appointment with a cardiologist down here who's supposedly really, really good, very well respected. And um, I thought, is what you're talking about, is that the same thing as a gated blood pulse scan? Yeah, it's it, that's just the abbreviation of the whole Okay, technology. gotcha. So I have... Um, the cardiologist in Australia also mentioned that. Um, Peter also mentioned that that'd be good so that we have a very specific... Yeah, you have number. a very exact number, yeah. and then you could say, well, we did everything we can, and my number's good. I don't need it. Yeah. Or, it's, or, or, or it turns out 28, and you probably yeah. should get it. Yeah, right. So I think that's what my next step is. The problem was is it took two months to get in the scene. Sure. So hopefully I won't die before then. <laughs> but um, So that's what my plan is, was to see the new cardiologist um, uh, we've had all kinds of issues here with my um, insurance is why I'm sure. going to another cardiologist. But anyway, and it's good to get a second opinion, third opinion. But anyways, that's what my plan is, was to get a, I want to have the best information I have to make a, the right decision is really what it comes down to. Right. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would do the same exact thing. If somebody told me this, and I know I'm young and healthy and active and all that, I would get five opinions. I mean, and I haven't like seen any loss and of your performance. Insurance, your or... insurance has to pay for a second opinion. That's okay. that's not even an option. Yeah, we've had all kinds of issues with insurance. That's another video. <laughs> um, so that's that was kind of the bad news of the video. Is I wish that I, when I had my echocardiogram done, that it would have been fine and perfect. But that wasn't the case. I hesitated even doing this video, to be honest, because I know there's websites that will take pieces of this and bits of this and they'll publish it to try to get views and um, what have you. But I've always been real honest with my following. I've always told them exactly what's going on. They have my exact numbers and all this stuff. And obviously, I'm not trying to hide this, although I still feel kind of 50 50 about sharing this. So, um, well, that's really it for this video. So, um, I appreciate you looking at my blood work. I appreciate you looking at uh, the Mount Carmel imaging stuff and everything and all your advice. And I'm taking your advice. And I'm going to get the, the scan done that shows sure. a more accurate reading of where I'm at. And I am taking the blood thinner medications, the uh, uh, Eliquis, and I take the baby aspirin. I take Eliquis twice a day. Um, I'm so fanatical about it. I'll like take it before I go to the gym. And then I'll take it before I go out to coach football because I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, right. if I get dehydrated, my blood will get thicker. So That's I'm, true. <laughs> I'm like trying to calculate all this stuff in my head. And the baby aspirin I take at night before I go to bed, thinking that that's generally when your blood's a little thicker at night. Well, it's um, super long acting. The aspirin, even if you skipped it for a day, you'd be fine. But okay. It, that one you don't have to worry too much about when you take it. Okay. Are there any... Um, I'm, I know people are going to ask this. Are there any heart supplements? Are there like two or three things that you think are valid for just heart health? That's a really good question. <laughs> so almost all, so almost all medications started as an herb or a natural substance, anyways. Like lisinopril, which is a blood pressure medication. Do you know where that comes from? No. Uh, did they put you on that? They did. They did because yes. you have a weak heart or supposedly weak heart. You have to have that. It actually comes from viper venom. Oh, wow. See, I've been taking that on and off for years. Yeah, it's, it's a hypertensive medication. It's called an ACE inhibitor. They found that when a viper bites a human and injects all this ACE inhibitor into them, their blood pressure drops to very, very low, and you don't get perfusion in your organs or your brain or your body, and you eventually die. But they've also found that people on ACE inhibitors, regardless of what other condition they have, live longer. Um, Coumadin comes from sweet clover. It's a blood thinner. They, they found that sweet clover would cause people blood to get thinner when cows ate it they would bleed to death they'd have internal bleeding if they went to a pasture that was sweet clover um lipitor or all the statins come from red yeast rice yep. um there's so many i give like 100 examples but you get the point the point is that if it worked um we would use it like like fish oil they thought for a little while helped with triglycerides and some of your cholesterol profiles so they made one called lovaza which is prescription right. fish oil right. They later found it actually raises your bad cholesterol, so they stopped it. So then they found that only one part of the fish oil works, which is EPA. EPA, right. And they made that into a new drug called Vasipa. It's a prescription now called Vasipa. Okay. So there are things that work. There are supplements, but they usually become the next billion-dollar drug. Ah. Um, like perfect. if it's, I you, didn't you know I was taking viper go, venom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now you do. Viper venom. Uh, you can tell people you're like half viper. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so if these things work, they become a they become a prescription. Um, generally speaking, the stuff you buy at GNC or Target or Walmart or, or you know the supplement stores, most of the time might not even contain what they say they contain because they're not really mm. regulated. Unless they're like third party tested and all that, obviously that's a different story. Um, I I would I don't I mean it's kind of hard. It's so individual. You'd have to like tell me what you have, um, and then I could tell you what to take. We know that. All women need calcium because they have menstrual cycles and they, they need that. They lose mm -hmm. calcium and their bone density goes down. Lifting weights obviously helps with that too. It actually reverses loss of bone density. Um, we know vitamin D is huge too. We can give it as a prescription or the over-the-counter supplement. It's either E2 or E or D2 or D3. Mm -hmm. um, ergocalciferol is the prescription strength. The one you buy over the counter is D3. It's not a, it doesn't build up as fast, but it still works. Mm -hmm. um, almost everyone north of Atlanta is deficient in D3 because yeah. we don't get enough sun. Um, so those would be like the only two like minerals or supplements I'd tell people to take unless you have specific questions. Well, the D3 is interesting because um, that's the one I struggle with in, you know, in a non-tropical climate being a pale skin, right? 
Right. And I see when I don't take my D3, I see it go down. And when I take about 7,000 units a day, it goes back up. Right. But as soon as I stop taking it, it starts going yeah, down. Yeah, we want people to generally take three to 5,000 a day, and, and you might need a little more, but that, mm -hmm. that works. When we, when we prescribe, prescribe it to people, we put them on 50,000 units a week for 12 weeks to get them up, and then they can take the three to 5,000 a day. Or you can take them all on Sunday. Like it's not Fat like, soluble, right? So yeah, you don't have to take it once a day. You can take yeah. 15,000 on Sunday, just pop three pills and yeah. have the 5,000 and you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, th I think that's it. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure there's a million people that are gonna uh, ask questions. Um, now, you have a YouTube channel. I do. So why don't you tell everybody what your YouTube channel is? So the easiest way to get there, just type into your browser, drallo.tv, D-R-A-L-O.tv, and it should take you right there, or you can search for me on YouTube. And Dr. Allo, you, you do a lot of um, presentations uh, for up-and-coming doctors. For You want to talk a little bit about right. that? Right, yeah. So my YouTube channel is generally all my medical lectures that I've lectured to other physicians. And then I have some that are for patients. There's a playlist for doctors, and there's one for patients. And then there's a few like general ones that kind of cross over and could be for both. Um, it's mostly educational stuff. I should probably put more stuff on there. <laughs> yeah, well, um, YouTube is great. And uh, I would encourage you to put more out there. So, I will. Um, yeah, I certainly will. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I, I wanted to get an opinion of someone who's really 100 times smarter than me, who knows this stuff, rather than just me just taking a guess at it. So I appreciate getting it straight from an expert's opinion. And uh, we will see you guys next time.